Okay. So, hello, magandang hapon po sa lahat and welcome to the Intramuros Learning Sessions. This is now our 88th installment in this series and thank you for staying with us throughout this series. Okay, so today is the last day of the National Heritage Month and this session is in partnership with our out with one of IA's collaborators in our heritage promotion activities, the Republika Filipina Reenactment Group. They have been conducting reenactment re activities in Fort Santiago for the past several months, bringing to life once again the battles we fought for our nation. And our speaker for today is Mr. Diego Vicente Magallona, the researcher of the Republika Filipina Reenactment Group. And also with us is Mr. Alex Avila, the secretary of RFRG to walk us through the military uniforms in the late 19th century Philippines and their importance to our heritage. So before we begin, let us first go through our house rules again. So for Zoom attendees, you may raise your questions via uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of our screen. While for those viewing us via Facebook Live, you may raise your questions in the comment section. If you, rem if you wish to remain anonymous, please let us know or you may opt to change your display name here. Uh, please be reminded that only those who have successfully registered and viewed on Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate. A feedback form will be emailed to you after the session and the certificate will be sent within a week. Finally, please note that this webinar is recorded and the recording shall be made permanently available in IA's social media channels. So now let me introduce our guest speakers. Okay. Diego Magallone is a historical reenactor and a researcher of the Republica Filipina Reenactment Group. He graduated from the University of the Philippines de Leman with a Bachelor of Arts in History and formerly worked as an instructor at the Department of History, UP de Leman. He also does freelance writing research and research work, and his research interests include military history in the Philippine-American War and World War II in the Philippines. Alex Avila is the secretary and one of the researchers of the Republica Filipina Reenactment Group. He graduated from the city of Malabon University with a Bachelor of Science in Education, major in Social Studies. He was a former Japanese relations officer for the Community Leaders Association for Youth that cooperates with multilateral interaction with students or MIS, a Japanese NPO based in University of Tokyo. He's, he also does freelance Nihongo and Gen Ed tutorial. His research interests include early Filipino-Japanese relations, military history, Guardia Civil, Philippine Revolution, Philippine-American War, and World War II. So without further ado, let us please welcome our speaker, Mr. Diego Magallan. Diego? Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming and thanks IA for inviting me. It's nice to be here. Uh, so, okay, so ang talk ko today, uh, our talk today is about the various military uniforms uh, of the 19th century Philippines. So um, let me just share my screen since since this is about uniforms, no? it's kind of a fashion history in a sense. Uh my visual style. Uh, so ayon. So this uh the research for uh, no, the research that we put into this into this talk is basically the research that we've done in RFRG for the past few couple years. Uh and plus uh the additional research and writing that we did for the recently uh, the recent exhibit at Fort Santiago, uh, Kabihisnan, in partnership with Renatia Mento Manila. Uh, so we would, uh, I'm excited really to share, you know, some of what uh, what we have done here, you know, in recreating the, uh, in well, documenting and recreating the uniforms uh, of the late 19th century Philippines. So. Uh, what do we mean by the late 19th century Philippines and by the military, which military uniforms? Uh, well, I divided the presentation into three. The Ejército de Filipinas or the Army of the Spanish Army of the Philippines. So that's what it was called. Uh, so you'll notice they don't actually call them, they don't actually say, it doesn't literally translate to Spanish Army of the Philippines. It just says Army of the Philippines because uh, back in the colonial period, the 
Philippine Philippines was a Spanish construct. It was a Spanish territory, de ba? Uh, so there's there's no reason when you say Filipinas back then, automatic Spanish. It's it's under Spain. It's part of Spain, de ba? Uh, then you have the Katipunan and the Philippine Revolutionary Army, uh, and then finally the Ejército Filipino or the Philippine Republican Army. So ito yung Philippine Army uh, of the or the Army of the Philippine Republic, uh, particularly during the Philippine American War. Uh, particularly up to 1899, uh, but up to the following years as well. Uh, so I think it's important then to, uh, to explain a bit, Deva, for those who are unfamiliar with the uh, activity, the hobby of historical reenactment. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's more than just a hobby. You know? Well, it's, it started as a hobby. We do it for fun. But also, it, it's also an educational uh, experience. A living, it's a living history activity. No, uh, to that is done really to immerse audiences and and the reenactors, no, into into events and periods of the past. So we don't just wear, you know, we don't just wear uniforms. No, uh, we try to learn about we we learn about you know uh how these guys how these people who wore the uniforms and the and other period clothing how did they act how did they move you know in the case of in in the case of military which a lot of historical reenactment actually does focus on the military but living history historical reenactment it doesn't have to be all about the military you know uh but in terms because we're talking about the military now in terms of the military, it's about learning the drills. How did they drill? How did they command? How did they fight? No, and sometimes how did they live out on the field? Something which that RFRG hasn't done yet but wants to do, you no, know, is actually go out on the field, uh, and camp. You know, maybe take some trenches, see, and you try to experience what the soldiers of the past experienced. You no, know? uh, of course, it's not as dangerous as going into actual warfare, but it helps audiences and the reenactors imagine. You know, give them a better understanding of what life was like for these for people of the past, and really, uh, in in a sense, give a better appreciation, and also, uh, you know, more add more color to our understanding, our imagination of the past. You know, to really you know, really drive home now. You know, the people of the past they were not they were people just like us. Uh, uh so. And you know, I think one of the best ways to drive that home is to, to really bring the past to life, is to reenact, you no, know, to have these living history activities. So that's part of it. And why and then why why are uniforms so important? You no. Know? Oh, well, I think just like any when dealing with any form when you're studying any form of you know clothing, you no, know, across across time. Uh right? uniforms, clothing. But reflection yan na ano eh. It's a reflection of culture and identity. You know? Whether it's civilian or military, it reflects uh the period and the culture, the people, you know, of the of that time. You know? So it's it's important. It's ano, I think it's important. And you know, they when I you know personally I think it's very important that the example mean media that they pay attention to these kinds of details, you know. We don't. We never expect people to get every detail right because even reenactors and heat up and heat up. It's really difficult to get every detail right. But uh, when we do this research, when we try to recreate the uniforms, and then when we, you know, we like we want to see like when media portrays the Spanish or the Filipinos during the revolution, the nineteenth century. Uh, we want we like we would like them to get the, those details right because those little details help uh, bring out you know bring out and tell us, inform us today about, you know, how these people of the past lived, you know? So, yeah, and, and you know, if, you, and if, they, if, they, if they don't do that research, if people don't do that research and they, they portray things wrongly, you know, at worst, right? but at worst, right? you, could, you could perpetuate, you know, myths and falsehoods about that period based on, just, just based on, you know, if, if you're there, they're wearing the wrong stuff, right? uh, so anyway, Let's continue. The Ejército de Filipinas, or the army, the Spanish army of the Philippines. No? So this was the this was the this was the overseas army of Spain that garrisoned the Philippines. Uh, 
so circa 1870 so why late 18 why late 19th century why 18, why around 1870 is is that our starting point so one of the reasons is you know before the 1870s we don't really see a lot of uh a lot of depictions of soldiers in the philippines uh most of them are in paintings and so far i haven't seen any uh photos from before 1870 before the 1870s uh but before that you do have uh some consistent depictions of filipino soldiers in the 19th century uh so this this painting for example is by jose Ornato, jose honorato lozano who is uh perhaps more notable or most notable for uh, one being one of the pioneers of the letras y figuras uh, style. You know, they, they paint the letters yung, you know, in, in that very intricate, very detailed style. Na, no? uh, so these are, you know, um, this is a term that uh, we'll see again later, tropa indigena, you know, indigenous troops or native troops. So these, these are Filipinos, native Filipinos, uh, dressed in very, uh, very smart, uniforms these are likely parade uniforms but this is from 1847 you no know? and so at first i thought oh these must be their parade uniforms but then in but then there's a, you have other paintings like this one from 1850 depicting an 1848 event and i, I really apologize i forgot i forgot to write down the the painter of this is a spanish painter he's painting he was this is just a this is just a very small part of the painting this is like the, the corner of the painting uh depicting the uh the spanish armies attack on the island of Balangingi uh, in the Sulu archipelago. So Balangingi was part of the Sulu Sultanate in the 1840s. Uh, and it was, it, it was uh, the Spanish considered it a den of piracy, but it was part of the Sulu Sultanate. And it was a base for their uh, raiding, slave raiding operations. So the Spanish, uh, the Spanish sent punitive expeditions to Sulu, particularly to Balangingi. And you can see here in the foreground, you have uh, Filipinos in, civilian attire with swords and spears and shields but behind them you have a formation of native troops again native filipino soldiers uh in the um, in almost the same uniforms as those painted by lozano in 1847 uh almost the same uniforms but with they are wearing salakot and the spanish officers who are leading them are also wearing salakot you know the conical hats so it's very interesting to see that mix of you know european style uh European style, you know, European style military uniforms with the Filipino uh, native headdress. You know? And then you have also some Filipino troops wearing the European style shako as well, particularly there in the in the background. But also here, one of the soldiers, one of the Filipino soldiers here in the foreground is wearing a shako. So moving on to the 1850s and 60s, uh, you have these these I know these uh paintings of uh native troops. So actually here you on the on the left. This is an 1862 plate of various uniforms of a native Filipino sergeant. So Filipinos could be NCOs in the army, but not officers. Uh, so on the left, you have the everyday, the service unit, the service dress, which uh, I I have only seen this this kind of uniform in this painting, so I have my doubts on to how uh, accurate it actually is. But it is this is an 1862 painting, so this might be an early version of the Rayadillo uniform. Uh, but then on the right, you see their campaign uniform, which they wore in battle uh, or or on the march. So, uh, and you'll, you'll notice the bare feet. Uh, Filipino soldiers are almost always bare feet uh, in, the, in, in this period, 19th century. Uh, not because the Spanish don't give them shoes, but because most Filipino soldiers were accustomed to uh, walking, marching barefoot. And this is because most Filipino soldiers would be recruited from the native peasantry of the Philippines. Uh, they are accustomed to working barefoot on the fields. And so actually you see some, I'll show you another photo later to help uh, reinforce this point. Uh, but here you see again the salakot and those uniforms. Uh, so why going back to why 1870s, uh, this is where we start seeing photos. You know, so something about the paint. One of the problems with with artistic paintings is that you don't know really the full context of the painting. Sometimes it's like, are they are they painting? Are are they? Is this an idealized view? Is this a romanticized 
view or are they actually painting it? Uh, well, for some of these uniforms, I'm more, con more or less convinced because they are consistent across paintings. But uh, you know, there's there's always that there's that lack of there's there's a, still a lack of detail, you know, exact details, exact colors, and materials that are it's hard to it's hard to uh, get from paintings sometimes, you know. Uh, but with the introduction of photography, you can really see the uh, you can really see you know more details you know all of the little details in the uniforms as they were at the time because it's a photo so uh so this is this is this is an 1870s photo uh taken from the collection of a russian admiral who visited the philippines around 1870 or 1871 and you can see the the two uh the first two photos uh from the left so these this these first two photos like uh, the wait long uh, so these first two photos are gala or parade dress. Uh, and interestingly, one of these photos was colorized. Uh, and you can, which is very interesting because then we can, we have, uh, we can see the red. It, it is a white uniform or an off-white uniform with uh, red trimmings, you know, cuffs and uh, collars and other stuff. And an interesting thing is that the salakot kind of made, gave way to the, Pith helmet. This is an earlier design of the pith helmet from the 1870s. So the pith helmet, uh, we'll see this more often from this point. You know, uh, the pith helmet was developed uh, by the British Army you know, uh, for use in India and other tropical climates. It's made of pith. Pith is the. It's called pith helmet because of the material it was originally made of. But it could also be made of cork or uh, coconut coconut shell. In the in the case of the Philippines, you know, the in the Philippines, particularly in World War. In World War II, they'd have they'd have sun helmets made of guinea, you no know, coconut fiber. Bas they basically serve the same purpose as the pit helmet, uh, being a sun hat. It doesn't protect you from anything like bullets or shrapnel, like steel helmets of World War One and later would protect you. But it does protect you from the sun, and uh, it's cooler than a felt hat, like like for example those worn earlier in the century, like these. So going back. Uh, here you have the introduction of the pit helmet, which you know in Filipino in no, no, in, in Filipino you know, there's some there's some translations that translate uh that translate uh pit helmet as salakot in Spanish. So sometimes there's yeah there's some Spanish translations of pit helmet sal it's salakot, but they also use the term uh capacete or helmet. You know? So it's interesting that uh to me uh, some people have suggested that I I've read this I read this on the internet so I can't verify. It. But some people have suggested that the salakot that that the pith helmet was uh was modeled after the salakot, which is why the Spanish still called it salakot. Me, I'm doubtful. Uh, I'm still doubtful. You know, we need evidence. We need evidence. But you know, uh, because I think it a uh, a similar explanation could be well, they serve the same function. They're both sun hats. They're both sun helmets. So why change the name? No. Because before this, they were using salakot as their sun helmet. No? So on the right, you have the uh, the diario or service dress, which is what they would wear on just ordinary days on duty. No, uh, not necessarily on the march or in battle. So that that was that is called uh, de campaña, no, uh, traje de campaña or campaign dress. So, which unfortunately, this collection of this Russian admiral did not have any photo of a uh, Filipino soldier in campaign dress, but. So when you think of the 1870s, one of the most uh, one of the most pivotal events of that period is the uh, the Cavite mutiny, uh, and which in 1872. And if you imagine the Cavite mutiny, thanks to these photos, actually you can imagine that uh, they look the soldiers, the Filipino soldiers who mutinied against the Spanish. You know, they would look closer to this, no? uh, which is interesting. So actually, RFRG was involved in. Uh, the NH the recent NHCP documentary on Gombursa, so the, the events of Gombursa are of course closely related to the uh, sorry the martyrdom of Gombursa is closely related to the events of the Cavite mutiny. So it's in, so you know I recommend you watch that. You know? And we RFRG of course uh, we were involved in that, and we did we were involved in the research of the uniforms. Uh, of course, in in the documentary, it's not perfect because we had we didn't have that much time to prepare the uniforms. But you know, we tried to model some of the uniforms after these photos. Uh, so if you watch that documentary, you can see you can see the Philippine soldiers wearing something similar to the gala dress there. No. 
So then moving on to the 1880s, you see uh you see more of the you know itong sombrero na ginagamit. So these are native uh soldiers, you know. The original the album where I found where we got this from, it's it it states that these are artilleria soldiers. Uh which is interesting because uh in 1872 after the Cavite mutiny, the Spanish actually disbanded the artillery units of the army of the Philippines and replaced it with a European, an all European artillery unit because some of the uh, Filipino soldiers who mutinied were artillery soldiers. And I guess that might have been a wake up call to the Spaniards. Now, if they, sorry, I need to close my Facebook. Uh, it might have been a wake up call to the Spaniards. Now, if it's dangerous to have Filipinos trained in artillery, if they, you know, because if they if they rise against us and you know they know how to use artillery, uh, well they outnumber us, and plus they outnumber us, you know, if you're thinking from the point of view of the Spaniards. So I'm I'm not sure if this if the caption is correct that these are artillery men. It's possible they are at, uh, sappers or engineer part of the engineering uh, units, you know, that are that would have been attached to some of the artillery units. Uh, so here you see native soldiers again, but you know this, this is a native soldier in various uniforms, his marching or service uniform and his uh, gala parade uniform. So here you can see wearing boots in Kapag Parade, they're wearing boots and uh, on the field, they're wearing, uh, they're not wearing any any footwear. So, but you can see he has like a, he has like a pickaxe. So he's part of probably, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking probably part of the tappers. No? So, uh, excuse me. Hello. Hello. I'm I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a Sorry, I'm I'm at I'm at home right now. So, uh, take lang. Can I mute myself? Oh God, I'm so sorry. Paki mute na lang ako. Oh no. Tao pala sa labas ng bahay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ay, nako. I'm so sorry. I'm back. Uh, share screen. Huh. Okay, that was embarrassing. But anyway, uh, sige. Pabilisan ko na lang. Uh, so yun, and maganda sa album na ito was that this is taken in 1885 before the Spanish army's expedition to the Marianas. Uh, ay, sorry, the Marianas. Yeah, I think, I, the, yeah, the Marianas. Uh, no. uh, because there, there there were some, you know, there was there were some, uh, what dito? Some events happening there na that, that, that needed, you know, uh, military intervention. So actually, there were so there were photographers that actually took photos of these soldiers in various in the various different uniforms. So we know how the Spanish army looked in the 1880s. Uh, so staying in the 1880s, we have now the sorry the Guardia Civil, which was established in 1868. So this was a, a police force, a centralized police force uh, that was under the Spanish army. So they they were actually under the command. You know, they're, they're part of the command structure of the Ejército de Filipinas. You know, so they're kind so they're kind of a military police basically. Uh, so the early uniforms of the Guardia Civil, as you can see here, uh they had a lot, they had a lot of you know, intricacies to them. So this is called the Levita uniform. They had chest stripes and decorative cuffs, uh in, in addition to yung the aguilets and you know, and all. So we can see we'll see later how you know, how this uniform changed. You know? In 1872, they actually uh, created the Guardia Civil Veterana. So th this was after the events of the Cavite Mutiny. Uh, the Veterana they were made they were created to police Manila and its environs, so the suburbs around Manila. So here is the recreation. Since we really we have that's like the only photo that I have right now. The, the previous photo. This is the only one I have right now of that old Guardia Civil uniform. So. To get a better idea, here's our recreation that we made for the Gombursa documentary that uh, that Sir Larry Ronquillo made for the Gombursa documentary. Uh, uh, so in the 1870s, this is what they looked like. 
Uh, and 1880s, they changed by the 1880s, they changed the uniform into a simpler, uh, simpler one. So you can see it's plain. A lot of the designs were, a lot of the you know the intricacies were removed, particularly the the chest, uh, the chest stripes and the uh, inter the cuffs. But you can see here on the right the gala uniform. Uh, they had removable, uh, they had removable red collars and cuffs for gala uniform. Uh, meanwhile, and you can see actually that their uniforms they only have one chest pocket. Uh, while if we go to the more the more elite unit, the Guardia Civil Veterana, which guards Manila, uh, here on the left you see a an example of their blue side uniform. Uh, they have two chest pockets that are in the Guerrera style. Uh, I'll get into the Guerre Guerre what Guerrera is in a, in a moment, no. And this photo is actually from the photo on the right is actually from 1896, right after the outbreak of the revolution. So these are uh, Guardia Civil Veterana, and you can see these are native Filipinos again serving. Uh, in the Guardia Civil. Most of the Guardia Civil, again, were native Filipinos. And so you can see they have the, they're wearing that uniform with their uh, Remington, Remington rifles and gear. Uh, and they were posing, in the full photo of this, they're posing with captured Filipinos, uh, captured Katipuneros, essentially, uh, after the outbreak of the revolution. And here is a photo of, uh, you know, a, re a reenactment photo of you know, Guardia Civil officers and some Guardia Civil soldiers uh, in, in Intramuros. No? Uh, so they are reenacting as the Guardia Civil Veterana and uh, one of them is, uh, the, is, is dressed as the Governor General, which I, I, I didn't have a section for the Governor General's attire. No? But uh, they would look something like this. You know? uh, something, an interesting uh, Tidbit, no. A lot of a lot of times when the Guardia Civil or Guardia Civil Veterana are, are portrayed by media, uh, they make this mistake of making the uh, sardinetas or the the collar cuffs, uh, the collar thingies here, they make them yellow uh, or gold. And part uh, what what I th why I think a possible reason they they do that is because when they look maybe they look they saw a photo like this of an older an old weathered uniform and they see that the sardinetas are kind of yellow because they they were white and they yellowed over time you know uh and so they made it they thought it was yellow or gold so they made it gold but actually in actuality they were white uh so yeah that's just a fun fact and now we're going back to the regular or the main army of the philippines and i think something that is kind of uh that a lot of people might forget is that a lot of the soldiers that fought in the philip for the spanish under the Spanish in the Philippine Revolution were actually Filipinos as well. Uh, the bulk of the Spanish army in the Philippines, the bulk of the heads of the Filipinas before the arrival of the Casadores in 1896, you know, uh, in response to the Philippine Revolution, the majority of those infantrymen were native Filipinos, and they were organized the seven regiments uh, and stationed all over the archipelago. Most of them were in Luzon and Mindanao. Uh, uh, and so here you can see uh, earlier I mentioned that you know Filipinos were more accustomed to walking barefoot and marching barefoot. So if you if you look at his feet, there his toes are kind of uh, they're kind of wide, no, they're kind of wide compared to you know some a lot of some or, or some of our feet today. So in it, it, you know nag adapt yung ano eh, nag, nag adapt yung feet to walking barefoot. And so you can imagine shoes would be more would actually cause them discomfort on the march. Uh, and you have to consider also the shoes. Shoes back then we didn't have, you know, uh, they were not as comfortable as modern day shoes, you know. So it would have been uncomfortable for many Filipinos, you know, especially if they grew up uh, working barefoot you know, from a young age. So here you can see you know, on the left. So the man on the left is a native Filipino soldier uh wearing basically his full kit including his backpack his canteen which is made of bamboo and his remington rifle uh, and then here you see a photo from around circa 1898 uh of you know a big a large formation of filipino soldiers uh, and here is one of our reenactment photos no? uh, so please you know forgive some of the inaccuracies again this is an expensive hobby so not everyone can afford everything right away so but on the 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 far the furthest the furthest left infantryman is holding a replica Remington rolling block. It's Marco, 
you know? uh, that's what that's the rifle that they would have used. So the uniform that they are wearing is called the Guerrera tunic, you no? Know? Uh, and what's interesting about the Guerrera tunic uh, is that, you know, it is notable for its, you know, you can identify it because of its uh, two chest pockets, and it doesn't have, and it doesn't have any pockets in the lower part of the garment, just the just the two chest pockets. No? And what's interesting about this is that the different uh, the different armies of the of the Spanish ultramar, the overseas territories. They had these. They all had different variations of this uniform. So you can actually identify whether a uniform is from the Spanish, uh, the Spanish Philippines, Spanish Cuba, or Spanish Puerto Rico, if I'm not mistaken. You no. Know, so those, that's where they adopted this, uh, this Guerrera style uniform in Rayadillo. You no, know, the Rayadillo fabric, which they used for the tropical for tropical climates. Uh, so Rayadillo means, you know, Rayadillo literally means like. Uh, small small stripes no uh and it is basically a blue and white striped fabric so sometimes it was made in uh some of them were made in spain and but also there was local production here in the philippines and guerrera uniforms from the philippines looked like this uh there's an i'll show an example of a cuban version later but what makes the filipino guerreras unique or distinct is that their buttons are hidden by this fly or lapel here and uh, only Filipino Guerrero uniforms, Philippine Guerrero uniforms, because not only worn by Filipinas, they were of course worn also by Spaniards in the Spanish army. Uh, Guerreras from the Philippines are the only ones you will see with these vertical uh, standing collars, you know, like, like the Chinese collars. Uh, so not all Filipino Guerreras had standing collars, but only Filipino Guerreras had standing collars. So the ones in Cuba and Puerto Rico, they do not have they do not have standing collars, but some in the Philippines they do have. And here you see on the right, uh, in the right, Filipino, uh, some Filipino Filipino NCOs with a Spanish soldier behind them. You know? So mind you, in the Philippine, uh, these native regiments, you know, they were made up of Filipino soldiers, all native Filipino soldiers, or the NCOs, but they had the NCOs. Uh, they had, I think, a number of native NCOs and Spanish NCOs in each, uh, in each unit, and then uh, they were, of course, led by a Spanish officer. So you know, there were no Filipino, there were no, you know, there were no native Filipino officers in the Spanish army. So you have to consider, you know, the the racial hierarchy at the time. You know? uh, so yes, they could serve in the army, but they could not lead. You know? So yeah, so and you know, uh, just to show you their leather equipment. You know, the leather equipment of a native Filipino soldier. This is the 1886 infantry equipment, so suspenders. And what you're looking at here is a Cuban style, you no, know, Cuban style Guerrera, with the exposed buttons, uh, folded collar, and it actually has these uh, buttons on the back, on the back of the garment, on the back of the tunic, you no. Know. Uh, so with with that, you no, know, you can actually identify from the photo of the execution of Rizal that. The, the firing squad consisted of uh, native soldiers. You can see them here, uh, barefoot. They're barefoot. These two lines are barefooted, and they're wearing the suspenders, the 1886 suspenders. Uh, but then behind them, you have the Spanish. You, you can't really see much of them, but you know, you see uh, probably members of the Leales Voluntarios de Manila who were there to guard and make sure that the the, the men in front would execute the execute Doctor Rizal. No? So you know, something that's uh, something to note again in, in the Spanish army is that they were there were many Filipinos in the Spanish army, you know? uh, and which leads me to one of the more interesting and lesser known units of the Spanish army in the Philippines uh, during the revolution, which is the Leales Voluntarios de Manila, which was a battalion of volunteers, one of several battalions of volunteers raised by the Spanish. Uh, so the Manila volunteers are probably the most uh, the most notable, most known, and they're very interesting because they, uh, because their their troops, you know, and their ordin their their common their common soldiers were a mix of Filipino and Spanish. Uh, so you have native Filipinos and also you know Spanish Spaniards, uh, fight uh, marching in the line together or 
uh, rather than you know Spanish officers leading all all native troops. So that's something interesting about the uh, Liales Voluntarios. So you can actually see it here in this photo. Now you have natives. You can see natives. You can see Spaniards. Uh, and they had this uniform that was uh, basically a Guerrera pattern tunic. But we are actually not sure if they wore Rayadillo or because we have one account that says that they had Kanyamo uniforms, which is Kanyamo is like a uh, a kind, it's, a, a, it's similar to a, it's similar to hemp, no? Uh, linen or hemp, yeah. Uh, and it, so it would be like a grayish brown color if if that account is to be is true, no? And then they would have red trimmings, you know, red uh, red shul, red red epaulets, red colors, and red uh, cuffs on their uniforms. So this was one of many volunteer uh, battalions. Another another notable one is the Ilo Ilo volunteers, uh, which they sent which they sent to uh, Luzon to help fight the revolution. And so here are their officers and then some of their you know their uh, abanderados, uh, their flag bearers. And then uh, okay for the next one you have the uniform of the cazadores, so or the cazadores, no. Uh, so we hear this a lot, and hey, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, forgot to mention, you know, sa ano, uh, Sir Diego Torres actually pointed out when we were doing the research for the exhibit that this photo was actually taken at. We identified the location of this photo as Plaza Moriones in, uh, which is today part of Fort Santiago in Intramuros, no? Uh, so back then it was out technically out technically outside Fort Santiago. No, pero the this this stone building at the back that you can see uh, here is is where the IVC, the Intramuros Visitor Center, is today. Uh, you can see may mga tao sa taas, no? And so thank you, Alex, for reminding me that I, I was gonna, I was really gonna to say that, no? So this is this is actually this photo was taken in uh, the grounds of Fort Santiago. No? Now, uh, one of the major factors that turned the tide that really helped turn the tide against the revolution in 1897 was the arrival of uh, 15 battalions of expeditionary cazadores from uh, peninsular Spain. So these men were full-blooded Spaniards. They were well-trained, well-motivated. And cazadores is uh, literally means hunter, no? Or hunters. No, cazadores, hunter, cazadores, hunters. Uh, but in terms of in the context of military, you know, the military uh, military definitions, cazadores is the word, is the term that the Spanish use and Portu the Spanish and the Portuguese use uh, to refer to their light infantry. So their light infantry basically they specialize really in skirmishing tactics. So rather than rather than being in uh, in a more fixed line or in a they're much more flexible. You know, they're very good at maneuvering, at harassing the enemy. Uh, and so they were very they performed they very well against the revolutionary forces, no, in particularly in Cavite and in Bulacan as well. So some of the some of the import some of the uh, very important battles in the Spanish counteroffensive of General La Chambre, including the Battle of Silang in Cavite, uh, and north in Bulacan you have the uh, the Battle of Cacarong de Sili, where Casadores really led the charge and they. It, it led to really a massacre of the revolutionary forces at Kakarong de Sili. Um, so they were they were very they were ruthless and actually you know, they were uh, accounts and even poems I believe about you know how ruthless the, the Casadores could be, you know, and how means and how abusive they were. So they were but they were very very skilled soldiers, you know, and they were equipped with the most modern equipment that Spain, Spain had at the time. So actually, this photo was taken after sometime after Kakarong de Sili, uh, and the photo, the man in the photo, the prisoner in the photo is uh, Maestro Sebio, who was the Katipunan leader at uh, at Kakarong de Sili. Uh, so, and of course, another unit of Casadores na who were uh, famous, you know, are the Casadores from uh, from the Second Battalion, the Second Expeditionary Battalion, who held out. In the Church of Baler, in uh, Taya then Tayabas, today Aurora, you know, uh, for a year, you know, which is for much, for basically months longer than Spain had already surrendered the Philippines to the U.S. So by the time the Philippine-American War was raging, they were still there. You no, know? uh, 
So here are more photos of the Casadores, and you can see the Casadores. You'll notice that they have a different uniform. They're not wearing Guerrera. Uh, they're not wearing the, the Guerrera, Guerrera tunic that I showed you earlier. So partial, part, part, partially because in you know, one of the reasons because they're from Spain, no, they're not wearing the the Philippine uniform, the the Army of the Philippines uniform. No, they came from Spain. Uh, so they're wearing what you call Guayabera. Well, the, the officers, if you see on the right, the officers are wearing Guerrera tunics. No? Uh, next, there we go. Uh, so here you can see the Guayabera tunic, which is a uniform that was modeled or based on uh, based on civilian attire worn in Cuba. So it's it based on a civilian jacket no? uh, from Cuba. So it features these uh, these pleats running down the center, and we'll see that this this design actually bleeds or uh, kind of passes on to some Filipino uniform designs later on. No? And then they are wearing the 1896 infantry equipment, which is uh, like this sling bag for their extra ammunition, and then for their their main ammunition pouches are these belt pouches on the front, which are. Uh, yeah, they're you know they're 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 attached to the belt. No, so this was to carry ammunition for the new uh, model 1893 Mauser rifle, which is a bolt action rifle, uh, which was capable of very fast uh, firing. No, and it in in the hands of well trained soldiers like the Casadores, they could really have a, a deadly impact on the on on on, on the Filipino revolutionaries. No. So that brings us to the Katipunan, no? And I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not taking too long. Oh no, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I went, I've, I've been going for a while now, sorry. So uh, Dito, when it comes to the Katipunan and the Philippine Revolutionary Army, you know, something that uh, we should take into consideration is for from 1896 to 1897, most Filipinos, they did not have uniforms per se, no? So, we're not really going to talk about the civilian uh, wear because uh, I'm not really I'm I'm not really well versed in in you know in talking about civilian clothing you know, from the period. But they would wear you know their their camisas, their uh their their work their working attire you know just really anything what was comfortable for them. Uh, later on, you you have officers adopting military uniforms, but again, most of the uh, most Filipino revolutionaries were just wearing their civilian attire. Um, so you'd have men in some some men in salakots, but most were actually wearing sombreros already. Uh, the salakot was was a rare was rarer to see. No, and the term sandatahanes because you see the you see the word here that is sandatahanes. Because uh, in reenactment we usually use that word to, to say okay you're not you're not part of the uniform forces you're part of the militia. The sandatahanes is basic was became basically. Uh, Synonymous with militia, no, or or basically uh, a non-uniformed military unit. But prior to 1898, no, the word sandatahan literally just translates to armed force, an armed group, basically sandatahan, uh, mga sandatahan or sandatahan, sandatahanes, no. If we do the you know, Hispanized plural pluralization, diba? sandatahanes, armed forces. That would be that. That's what it means. Uh, so prior to 1898, when you say sandatahan, it basically just means any any group of fighting people. Uh, but in 1898, what's interesting is that uh, in June 20, 1898, uh, the revolutionary government of, Aguina of Emilio Aguinaldo, they they actually had a decree on uh, governing towns, how 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 liberated towns should be governed and administered and administrated, no, towns and provinces, mga uh, bayan at mga kabayan, no. Uh, and part of that was the institutionalization and regulation of uh, san, sandata, sandatahan, uh, sandatatahang, ay, sorry, sandatahang taga alaga, or basically defense, armed defense forces. Basically, that's what it means, uh, defense or guard forces. So in a sense, they institutionalized the sandatahanes as a militia force uh, that could support the main army, but that's after 1898. So we're still in the, if, if we're still talking about the Katipunan, Sandatahan just means guys with weapons, you know, armed armed forces, armed groups, no? Uh, so 
so here you see so nakakamisa yung karamihan na kamisa no kamisa de chino and uh, various civilian uh, pants no uh, then here more reenactors in you know varying different pants and combination of pants and uh, and garments kasi kung tutusin you know people didn't just wear one white no? there are a lot of different kinds of fabrics and colors actually in in civilian clothing no and so moving on to officers of the katipunan particularly of or of the philippine revolutionary army so the revolution actually adopted ranks and uniforms early on as early as 1896 actually so these uh cuff ranks so they're wearing these what they're wearing basically are spanish style guerrera actually that's me there you can see me there uh these are spanish style guerrera so either they took it from they stole it from or captured it from the spanish or they had their own made because there was local rayadillo fabric production in the philippines back then uh and then they had these cuff ranks because at the time at the time the spanish army were were also using cuff ranks so the magdalo who were the first to adopt these ranks they developed these ranks for the revolution but later adopted by magdiwang and other uh, other councils and other groups of the revolution uh, these cuff these are red cuff ranks so the spanish cuff ranks are mostly in gold so, and here, here you see from uh, from Carlos Ronquillo the rank system of officers no, and enlisted men. But we don't really, we haven't really seen. Uh, we're not sure if this the enlisted men actually had because you know most most photos we see from 1898, uh, early 1898, 80 and earlier. Uh, naka naka civilian lang talaga yung mga ano yung mga sundalo. It's really only officers who would be in uniform. Uh, so these officer uniforms these with with these these cuffs these uh red cuff ranks it was discontinued with the introduction of new uniforms around mid 1898 uh where the when so mid 1898 so think june june 12 1898 uh independence was declared and soon after uh uh the revolutionary government was established in september the uh, Malolos Congress was convened, so you have the Philippines, you know, basically had de facto control over most of the country, and uh, their main problem, the main problem they faced, uh, aside from the the Americans who were building up their forces, you no, know, and were acting very suspicious, you no, know, uh, was gaining recognition from the international community at that time you know, it was very important you know, following you know following like say a you know, westphalian nation state system mahalaga na if they wanted their if they wanted the philippines to exist as an independent nation they had to get recognition from some of the great powers otherwise someone was going to eat them up if not the americans maybe someone else you no know? uh, so part of their efforts were uh you know aside from establishing a aside from you know in, in the mat in a matter of months they they established a very uh a working government you no know, a working civil government but aside from that you know they they wanted to show the world that uh they they were a functioning uh and very you know quote unquote civilized and uh sorry that i know that word is very loaded you know uh, but you know they they wanted to show the world that we are capable of of governing ourselves, and that you should you should respect our uh our our you know, our desire for your independence. And part of that was showing that we had an army, you know, an armed forces, you know, that could defend our country, that would defend our country, and that was professional. Uh, unfortunately, you no. Know, they only had a few months to organize that army. So the end was that they were not really professional, no. But some of their units looked, could look quite professional. Uh, so here you see a photo, you know, a, a period photo beside a reenactment photo of again Marco. Uh, you could see um, these soldiers are wearing uh, Guerrero uniforms, captured from most of their gear uniforms were captured from the Spanish. And you can see they're wearing the Spanish 1886 uh, equipment and they have the Remington rolling block rifles. So, uh, and yeah, very sharply dressed, they're, they're drilling, they had these, you know, their informations, they learn how to drill. You know? 
uh, that was very important. That's and something I think you know in in media, I guess you could say, uh, like movies, some movies and uh, and other media when they depict you know the Philippine Revolution and the Philippine American War, I think sometimes they they might fall into two extremes. Either uh, we are just a ragtag bunch of uh, guys wearing whatever we what whatever we have, fighting with whatever we we have, you know. Uh, versus they say what oh we had a professional a very professional and uniformed army with our own uniforms the truth is the reality based on photos and accounts is somewhere in between that in the months between uh june 1898 when we declared when the philippines declared independence and february 1899 when the war with the united states broke out uh the philippines made an effort to to try to professionalize the army you know uh so but just a, just you know a few months is not enough time to build uh, a professional army so you see photos you have photos like this where everyone is uniformed everyone has some uh if, if some some people have some of the soldiers have complete complete suspenders and and pouches uh but some of them they only have the belt and a pouch but they all have uniforms right and they all have rifles they all have bayonets uh you have photos like that you have units in the philippine army like that but you also have many units that look more like this where they're wearing some of them are wearing guerrero uniforms some of them are still in civilian attire uh chop suey chop suey na yung yung mga equipment nila they are cannibalized or split over divided by uh, no across the uh, by among the different soldiers no so yun some some units were more uniformed than others there was an effort to professionalize the army in terms of uniforms and drills but there was simply not enough time no? so you have you have that you have some units that look so, that look very well dressed very uniformed some units uh look like a mix and some just don't even have uniforms at all no uh and you can see they wore so 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 the uniforms of the philippine army particularly the infantry because most of them were actually infantry we did not really have that much in the in the form of artillery or cavalry no uh so most of them would have Guerrera uniforms that were captured from the Spanish army. Then you'd mix that in with with men in civilian attire, and also some in the uh, new Philippine Mambisa uniforms. Uh, but mostly the officers wore that. I'll get to that. I'll get to that very soon. Uh, ano ang Mambisa uniform? So again, here's another example of uh, the they had to distribute captured Spanish equipment among the troops. So all of these men, these are from uh, this is from a photo of uh, General Gregorio del Pilar and his soldiers. So it's an elite unit. You now they have, they all have uniforms. Most of them are wearing Spanish Guerrero uniforms, Spanish Army Guerrero uniforms. The officers, most of the officers are wearing Philippine Mambisa uniforms. Uh, they have Mausers, so the most modern firearm that they could get their hands on. But their equipment is incomplete. Now they're missing the. Uh, the belt pouches, which is you can see belt pouches being worn by an officer uh, in the background of the photo. No? So yeah, when when thinking about you know Filipino and and when in terms of reenactment, that actually makes it a bit easier because it means if you want to reenact the Philippine Republican Army, you don't actually have to have complete equipment because it's actually more accurate that your equipment is incomplete. Uh, so again, yeah, oh sorry. Here's another photo. Very well dressed, uniformed Filipino soldiers of the Philippine Army. The officer there, where with the white hat near the lamppost, uh, he is wearing a mambisa, which is what I'm going to present next. And here you see another example of. So here, in, in, in this photo, they are all very well uniformed. But again, the Mauser equipment is split between the troops. Some of them only have the a belt and a and the, the sling bag. Some of them only have the belt pouches. Uh, then here you have a photo where really it's a mixed bag. You have guys in Guerrera. Uh, most of the office, most of the guys are in Guerrera uniforms. You have the two officers in front in Mambisa uniforms, uh, and then you have some of some guys and even kids wearing civilian attire. No, which brings me to the Mambisa. What is the Mambisa? Uh, some of you, some some people in the audience, and some guys, some of the guys then uh, maybe familiar with this as the quote unquote Norfolk style uniform. Now, why do I not call it the Norfolk style uniform? So based on you know, our research, I haven't found any uh, reference to 
you know, primary sources calling that where they call it, where they make any reference to the Norfolk style jacket. So the reason why it used to be called Norf, people used to call it Norfolk, you know, particularly collectors, is that they saw they saw similarities with the English Norfolk style ja Norfolk hunting jacket, and they had this speculation and uh, that maybe they they came up the the Hong Kong junta Emilio Aguinaldo came up with this design and may, or and there's also this uh there's also this uh common story that this was popular story that Juan Luna designed it again we have no proof of that it's a it's a story uh we don't have the primary sources that say that Juan Luna designed this so whoever designed it uh one of the stories you know, is that you know either Juan Luna designed it or uh Aguinaldo and his men designed it after seeing British or Englishmen wearing that jacket in Hong Kong because Hong Kong was British, a British colony at the time. Uh, now, we don't know how true that is. Another explanation is that uh, they based this design off the uh, Spanish Guayabera uniforms. No? And the Guayabera uniforms, which were based on Cuban attire, uh, me, I find this more likely because they call it Mambisa, because they call these uniforms Mambisas. Uh, and Mambisa, why when do they call this that? Where do they call it Mambisa? Yung primary source natin there is uh, from the laws of the first Philippine Republic, where uh it where the it was November, November 1898, where the government, the Philippine government released uh released a decree of regulations for army uh for officers of the army. And they refer to these uniforms as their un they refer to their jackets as mambisa. Uh, what is a mambisa? No, mambises are the uh, Cuban free or is an is a name for the Cuban freedom fighters. And my uh, you know what again we don't have the we don't have the concrete evidence for this, but probably they named it after the after the uh, Cuban freedom fighters. Uh, though we do have we do have one account from Jose Alejandrino. Who states that the new uniforms you're re referring to these Mambisa uh, uniforms are uh, or were modeled after the uh, Chaqueta Mambisa uh, of Cuba. So the jackets worn by the Mambisas. So possibly uh, that is where the root of this uniform is. So, so now we're so now RFRD we we're, we're forwarding the no we're not calling this Norfolk anymore because we don't have evidence that it was. That the Norfolk jackets influenced it in any way, no. Uh, we are calling it the Mambisa because that is what the Republic, uh, the Army of the Republic called it. No? So this is a uniform that is unique or distinct to the Philippine Army. So earlier on, you see, we, I mentioned that many uniforms were captured from the Spanish, the Galera uniforms. These uniforms were made specifically for the Philippines by the Philippine government, no, by the Philippine Army. So it is a unique, a distinct uniform for the Philippine Army that only belongs to them, you no. Know? Uh, and I guess you know some, and I think it was popularized in recent years by General by the General Luna film, which, which fall, which which unfortunately falls into that extreme of everyone has to wear that uniform. Everyone they made everyone wear that uniform, and in reality, uh, very few, very few soldiers actually wore this uniform. But most of the officers, as you can see in this photo, wore the unif wore this uniform. No, however, yun nga, it is uh, it's also wrong to say that that enlisted men did not wear the Mambisa uniform, the Mambisa de Raidilio, because you can see this photo right here of three enlisted Filipino soldiers wearing the Mambisa uniform, and it came in uh, various in various forms actually, because uh, they could they, I guess they didn't have time. Like the it's speculation because they did not have time uh, or the resources to truly make it standardized. So you have variants of the Mambisa uniform. What they have in common is that they have these vertical pleats with uh, vertical pockets, vertical uh, pocket flaps. But some of them have exposed buttons. Some of them have hidden buttons like the Guerrera. As you can see here, these enlisted men are wearing the hidden button, the one with the hidden buttons. Uh, and there were several variants. Uh, there are several variants of the Mambisa uniform made in different fabrics that were uh, stated in the regulation. So you have the Blanca, Mambisa Blanca, which is white or off-white for Aguila. You have the Kaki or Kaki, the Gingon, which is a dungaree. Uh, it is a, it's a coarse, Gingon is a coarse uh, cotton cloth that is used, often used for pants, no? Uh, and, all, some, and other, some other military universe. And the Kanyamo, which I mentioned earlier, is 
a hemp like uh, fabric, which is like gray brown in color. But something to note is that we only have, we only really have physical evidence for the Blanca and the Blanca, the Rayadilio, and the Kaki. We haven't seen a, an upper garment na ginggon na in this pattern or Kanyamo for that matter. So, and then you have the ranks. They we, Again, I mentioned that the earlier ranks were superseded. So this is just one uh, chart actually of ranks no, for the Philippine Republican Army in 1890, late 1898 and 1899 onward. Uh, Red, the red shoulders was were, was actually worn by generals and by infantrymen, but you also have uh, some different colors, like the uh, for for cavalrymen it would be black, uh, for sanidad militar it would be amarillo or yellow, no. Uh, so there's actually this myth going around that it's that they had pink shoulder the medics, the sanidad militar, the medics had pink shoulder boards. There's no evidence for that. The insignia. The, sorry, the regulation state amarillo, which is yellow, no, not pink. If there's pink, it would be rosa. No, they would state rosa or or a, a similar color. No. Uh, so yon. and here and then here some excerpts from that. You know, uh, from the regulations. Looking at so, amaganadios, you see that the Philippines, the Philippine army and the Philippine Republic, they were trying to really build an identity for themselves. And I think why this uniform is important is that it's it's part of that identity and nation building, you know. Now it was kind of rushed because you know we were we were we were at the we were at the brink of war with the Americans, you know, and yes, we did go to war with the Americans, you know. So uh we had to defend our country again from US imperialism. So uh and I think you know the Mambisa I think is very is the, probably the most significant uh uniform that I have shown here in terms of the Filipino because you know, we have, we go from you know Spanish uniforms introduced by the Spanish one by the that have their own actually their own identity as you know his Spanish Filipino no uniform Spanish army uniforms worn only in the Philippines for example no like for example our Guardia Civil in Guardia Civil veteran and Guardia Civil uniforms only worn those were those were really only worn in the Philippines no uh it's you know part of the identity and the mambisa represents kind of like this okay one of the first uniforms of you know really the, or, or or the first uniform uh, of the in, of an independent philippines now that's truly unique uh to the you know to the, to the nation that's why i I'll end, i want to end with the mambisa now here you see officers wearing that uniform uh then the khaki the khaki variant which we're starting to think that this will, this this khaki variant it it's in the regulations, it was for engineers and uh, engineers and uh, sir, another 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 unit. I think staff, so military administration. I think or staff. No, uh, but what's interesting about this is that we also have accounts of other officers, infantry officers, and some other officers wearing khaki. So what's interesting is that khaki was becoming more pop, was starting to become more popular. No, one one of our speculations right now is that. Possibly in when they were in British Hong Kong, uh, Aguinaldo and the Hong Kong junta might have seen and have taken a liking to the khaki uniforms versus the Rayadillo. So you would have men like okay, this 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 uh General Juan Cailles, uh in a uniform that is very likely khaki and not Rayadillo. No? So I do not so I'm convinced this is not a Rayadillo uniform. This is most likely khaki. No. And you have again a you have descriptions of Aguinaldo on September 15, 1898, at the opening of the Malolos Congress, arriving at the town of Malolos, city of Malolos, wearing a khaki uniform. <clears throat> so khaki was becoming more popular. And actually, if you look at you know in the general in the worldwide scheme of things, uh, for in terms of you know uh, practical military uniforms, Rayadillo fell out of use already right after this time, uh, and khaki was really khaki kind of superseded it in tropical climates. No. So, and uh, it's interesting to know that that might have been the direction that the Philippines was going on prior to the outbreak of hostilities, prior to the U.S., uh, the, the Philippine-American War. No. So, uh, really, that's where I'll end because uh, when the war when the war started, uh, there wasn't really any more any much more evolution of uniforms in the Philippines in terms of the Philippine Republic because uh, late 1898. They would go into guerrilla fighting, where you know uniforms basically became uh, less relevant. Uh, but you would still see 
what's interesting is you still see men like uh, units like those of uh, General Juan Cailias when they surrender almost all of his men are still in uniform so they keep their they, they kept their uniforms all that time until 1901 uh, they'd still have uniforms you no know? and so you know, I, I know I'm sorry I'm very sorry for uh, extending really I, I, I really extended you know uh, I might have overextended but that's where you know that's where we'll kind of end for now uh, sorry that's where we'll end the talk uh, on the uniforms and you know I'm looking forward to your questions about uniforms about reenactment uh, here's uh, just a, a list of some of our uh, sources for that we used for the exhibit and for our research. Uh, you know, primary and secondary sources. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you, Diego, uh, for that very informative talk. Uh, and there is indeed so much research uh, in, involved behind the uniforms by our reenactors. So I will now open the floor for questions to our participants. If you have a question, if you have a question, please use the QA button if you are on Zoom or the comment section if you are joining us through our live streams. So we already have one question here in the QA Q &A I, section. I, I, Is there any evidence as to who, only men or women, who tailored who tailored or sued the uniforms? Mm -hmm. Meron bang okay so i'm i'm not actually sure uh, on you know uh so I, cause I i don't want to you know i don't want to be stereotyped now oh, women women more often were sewing the clothes no uh well that 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 does uh syempre, you know, traditional gender roles sa panahon na yan. pero so i don't i don't know exactly but we do know from the uh from the regulations actually uh, the November 1898 regulations of the Philippine Army uniform. So I'm not sure about the Spanish Army, uh, but I think I remember uh, his, the book ni Stephanie Stephanie Ku, uh, on you know, clothing the colony, which is about more on civilian fashions in the 19th century. Uh, she did mention Rayadillo being woven by women, uh, certain you know certain businesses, no. Uh, but in terms of the Philippine army, what something interesting about that is that the regulation, the November eighteen ninety eight regulations, actually uh, mentions, you no, know, uh, mentions a number of stores, my sastre, my hat maker, in Malolos, where uh, officers can have their new uniforms tailored. Now uh, I don't know if I have it with me right now. I have, I'd, have, I'd have to search for it. Uh, am I still sharing? I am still I'm still screen sharing. Oops, stop share. So yeah. Uh, I'd have to uh, wait, uh, search ko na lang. <laughs> Pero yeah, there, there were uh, no, there there were actually uh, designated uh, tailors for officers of the Philippine Army, and uh, most likely, because most likely the Spanish would have something like that as well during the span. During, you know, the Spanish Army would have had that as well uh, in Manila. So, but the the, the Philippine Army in uh, no, the First Republic, they they did actually have that. They had they had tailors and hat makers for for you know, to sew the uniforms for them. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, does the reenactment uh, entail certain figures? Because, you know, um, military uniforms into it. So, in, you know, military uniforms are surrounded by certain regulations. Eh. Do, do we have this kapag reenactment? Uh, I'm sorry, medyo, medyo, medyo na cut off yung first part ng question. Uh, tungkol sa ano po, regulations and ano? Wala, nawala, nawala ata si Sir, nakot of ata si Sir Christian. Ah, okay, okay, uh, while waiting for ano, Sir Christian for that question, I'll answer the uh, isa pang question here sa Zoom. Uh, were women soldiers in Barotsaya or did they also wear pants, assuming there were women soldiers? So, this is interesting because uh, 
we don't have any photo evidence of women wearing military uniforms or women joining the Philippine army but we do have stories of you know and accounts of of women uh, either in military uniforms we don't have photos but we have you know, you know we have cert- we have some american accounts saying that there were actually women in military uniforms uh uh and then you have stories you have stories of uh such as that of Trinidad Dexon who was known to be uh known to wear a military uniform no uh but most women who contributed to the revolution were not actually soldiers there were and it's important it's important to note and recognize that there were fighting soldiers no uh fighting women no uh not not all of them wore uniforms not all of uh, not all of, yeah not all of them wore uniforms so actually some of the particularly before before yung panahon ng philippine uh, before the film war for example uh yeah before the film war lalo na uh like during the during the battles in binakayan and ano, 1880 1896 uh there were women who joined the ranks of the revolutionaries some of them even to you know Uh, I think there was one account I forgot the name, but this was at this was at during the Battle of uh, Dalahican, where a woman actually ra- was uh, no, who joined the joined the fighting to uh, no, to avenge her husband who died, and she was basically you uh, know uh, while you uh, know natatakot yung mga ibang yung mga ibang revolutionary soldiers her, her she was fearless and she helped rally the troops to keep fighting, uh, but unfortunately and she she was killed. No, during that when while she was doing that no uh so ayun uh anonymous question personal question paano po kayo nahilig sa reenactment so uh well when i was i don't remember actually ano yung first interaction ko with reenactors but i've always had i've always had this fascination with you know with uh military military uniforms Uh, military history it's just always been so interesting for me and you know the first my first encounter i think with uh military reenactors was probably early in uh early in college uh when i was young i, I was a student in in up uh studying history you no know? and some for some events they would invite the philippine living history society Uh, so I'd met, I met I met some of I met some of uh, them and I thought oh it was really interesting that they these guys are uh, researching the uniforms the equipment and then dressing dressing up as them to get the feel of you know how did how did the soldiers of that time you know uh, feel and 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 yo know, that, that 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 was always interesting to me so yeah and I got I got into reenactment in 2019 uh 2018 before right like a year before Republica Filipina was founded no but uh you know it was actually the you know the president of RFRG who got me who first got me involved in reenactment no? and i think i'm going to say part part of it i'm going to admit part of what got me into reenactment aside from seeing the world war 2 reenactors was uh the that general luna movie which you know nowadays i think a lot of people will say okay daming mali diyan diba like i i, I even criticized it earlier diba but like like it had a lot of historical inaccuracies there's a lot a lot of problems with it but uh like the uniforms like wow it just really you know like it was it was it had an it kind of had an impact okay and the fact the fact that you know at some point they actually the the studio the production studio actually was uh renting out and selling the the, the uniforms So it it made it more it made it kind of accessible to to us it helped it, it so you know as much as we criticize you know uh the historical inaccuracies of Henry Luna today uh I I recognize you I recognize actually that the production of that film uh it, it helped it helped kind of boost RFRG because it, it 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 gave us a lot of you know resources and and it it piqued the interest of a lot of people you know and I think you know it, it opened it opened I think uh the idea in a lot of people's minds that okay you can do this you no know? uh and you know it's slowly slowly nga, we're building na okay from 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 these idealized romanticized uh images and uh and versions depictions of the Philippine army Philippine revolutionary army uh, we're slowly going to you know 
educate people na oh, actually ganito they were more like this you know uh, uh you know so yeah it, it's it, it was it's fun it was, it was, a, it was a, a lot of things got ultimately brought me into this this activity this hobby you know? uh okay. so yes one of the other questions that we have here is from an anonymous attendee uh, paano po at expensive po ba mag-join sa mga reenactment po? So most probably this person is uh, like many of us who are interested in this subject matter inquiry. Is it expensive? And how can one join uh, such reenactments? Okay, so short answer ng, is that yes, it's expensive. But the long answer is it doesn't have to be expensive right away. It doesn't have to be expensive to start, especially for... Uh, What's very nice about the Philippine Revolution, itong late 19th century period, if you want to be, if you want to start out, you know, yung Philippine, to reenact uh, the, the Philippine Revolution and the Philippine War, again, a lot of Filipino soldiers, a lot of Filipino fighters, revolutionary fighters, many of them were just wearing civilian attire. And it's not too difficult actually to, it's not too difficult and not very expensive to actually have just, you know, some Philippine, some of, uh, Filipiniana or Filipino, you know, clothing from that period. It's not it's not expensive to start out. Uh, but if if you're going to get into the hobby uh, as a long term thing, you know, it will be expensive in the long term if you want to have you know uh, an accurate uh, uniform, accurate equipment, you no, know, to to really show, you know, especially the especially if you want to portray the Spanish the Spanish army, for example. Yung mga indigenous soldiers ng Spanish army, they have a lot of equipment no, compared to the com compared to ordinary revolutionary soldier, no? So or the Guardia Civil, which you know that's a whole other unif yung mga Guardia Civil uniforms, that's a whole other uh uniform also, no? So in the long term, yes, definitely it's expensive, no. I don't wanna I don't wanna sugarcoat that. No, if you want kung ano, if you want to get into this hobby. But you know, it doesn't again, it's you know, it's uh it's a long term you know long term investment like it doesn't have to be like ah bayad kaya magbayad ka ng libo libo just to start out the hub you know it doesn't have to be like that you no know? it's like if you want to have an accurate uniform it's something you build over time you no know? uh pero yon uh i would i would recommend na i, I would advise to be responsible about your fight to you know to practice being responsible with your finances if you want to get into this hobby because you know if you really if you really really enjoy it you know uh you don't want to get carried away, Because <laughs> uh, it is expensive if you if you want if you really want to get into all of those things, no. So yeah, advice lang. Uh, aye, and if you want, I uh, know if you want to join, uh, there I think there there there's some groups in the Philippines uh, around the Philippines, but uh, the Republic of Filipina reenactment group, which is the group I am a part of, uh, but you can find us on Facebook actually and see, uh. You can, you know, I'll, I'll type the, you know, the type the spelling, uh, the the full name of the page. Then dito sa chat to, how do I send to everyone? Oh, I can't. Ah, okay, never mind. Pero ay na lang. Uh, kita naman sa sa mga ano eh, sa posts ng Intramuros administration, uh, Republika Filipina Reenactment Group. We have a Facebook page. No, uh, you can message us there if you're interested. Now, uh. Oh, so my second question. So yeah. So if you're interested in joining us, you and I hope to hear. We hope to hear from you. <laughs> uh, I should I I answer this question. How do they recruit Filipino soldier, and what are the process? Is there specific that they need to participate because we are under Spanish colonial? Uh, so in terms of the uh Spanish. Spanish army. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. I don't. We. I don't know the exact process of recruitment, but uh, because uh, because nga, you. But you did mention you know, because we are a uh, because we are a Spanish colonial territory. You no. Know, it. There was actually some. Uh, no, there was actually some uh, required requirements. You no. Know? So. They would well. There were. I'm not. I'm not actually sure about the indigenous regiments, no, that I mentioned earlier. If they were conscripted or if they were made up of volunteers, 
uh, we don't know the full ano we, we, unfortunately we don't we don't have the sources yet to really say na okay ganito yung ano but there were militias no there were there were militias per town per province that were required they were required to serve basically so Filipinos were actually required to serve at very least some militia no uh, able bodied Filipinos of the of adult age no they were required to train and serve in the cuadrilleros no so it's not i think it's not far fetched to say that the the army itself would have had uh would have might have had you know compulsory service then but uh i don't have the i don't have the evidence to say for sure na ganun. but in terms of militias in terms of you know local police local militias definitely filipinos were uh filipinos were uh had had to ano were 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 put into service uh pero yun in, in terms of the cuadrilleros which ano uh kasi parang local police yun eh so really the filipinos they really had to do that because they had to defend their own they had to defend the police their own towns for the most part no uh because yun, the guardia the guardia civil they were the centralized police force but they could not be everywhere at once no uh so around around the philippines you'd have the cuadrilleros and sila compulsory service for ng for ng able bodied males sa, sa community so they really had to serve so ganun yun so i hope i hope that was satisfactory no so i don't have all the answers unfortunately yeah. okay thank you diego i'm back sorry okay. for that ayun salamat okay. sa hello sir christian so an- ano ano pala yung tanong mo kanina and i i wasn't able to catch everything ayun uh, ulitin ko na lang ayun so mayroon ba certain rigors kapag uh, gumagamit ng military uniforms for an act Siyempre, military uniforms pa din to. And these are surrounded by certain regulations. So, meron bang ganun kapag reenactment na lang? Uh-oh. So, ayun, kapag reenactment, ano, I think mahalaga na we strike a balance. Kasi it's it's a hobby eh. Uh, but at the same time, you know, again, we, again, you want to you want to accurately and faithfully represent the armies, the, the fighting forces of the past. But at the same time, it's a hobby. And we can't be, we can't be strict like an actual, as strict as an actual military. Uh, but you know, we when ano, when we train our reenactors when we do our, our training, we try to ensure na you know, yun nga, there's a sense of diba, respect and ano, and discipline. Lalo na, lalo na since we're ano, for if for those that are uh, for those that are uh, depicting the revolutionaries, diba, these are we're depicting soldiers who fought, diba, uh, who fought and died for our country. No, so while uh, while ano, mahalaga na like. like for some people, I think my misconception na ah, dapat you you guys are in military uniforms, you guys are in radio, uh, dapat dapat snappy kayo, di ba? So, <laughs> alam, alam natin yung question na ganon. Eh. So tayo ng radio sa UPROTC. Pero I think ano for in terms of historical sa historical uniforms natin, uh, it's not exactly the same. Na so in terms of being accurate, actually, we're not. We purposefully, we purposefully say, hindi naman talaga snappy, snappy yung Philippine Revolutionary Army because let's face it, they were not very well trained. Uh, they did not have enough time to become a professional force. Pero at the same time, we try to, during reenactment events, and we try, and, and because some of our members, diba, we can't police, diba, deal in, in, diba, for specific uniforms like diba, modern day military uniforms or yung mga ROTC uniforms like the UP Rayadillo. Diba? You can you can police those because you know, those are official uniforms of ano. But in terms of the Rayadillo fabric itself and the historical and fabric, the the medyo mahirap i police, diba? So any kasi you know, anyone can buy Rayadillo fabric and make a uniform and wear it, diba? So we can't police that. We have no way to police that. What we can but what we do is we try to have and you know some of our guys they wear the Rayadillo uniform outside the context of reenactment. Uh some of them sa, ano, sa cosplay events sa ganon, di ba? We can and you know we can't police kasi freedom of expression. But uh but at the very least we try to have we try to ano vale inspire or in uh you know say indoctrinate. <laughs> uh we try to uh, to teach to try to you know encourage now we treat the, still treat the, regardless of the ba where you use the uniform we treat it with you know with a certain respect and ano Kasi, yun nga, these are historical uniforms and we want to be faithful. Again, especially in reenactment, but even outside, we want to be respectful and faithful of the history that these uniforms represent. No? Okay, thank you. 
Yeah. Kaya ako na itanong actually kasi syempre di ba may ibang veterans na alam very ano sila sa uniforms eh. Mm-mm, definitely. Uh, very particular sa doon. Mm-hmm. So, kaya yeah. ayun. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Y- I minsan mean, yung problema nga is yun nga. Anyone can, really, anyone can make pagawa readily uniform. So, uh, we can't police what people do with those uniforms but we what we can do is you know, yung mga main actors natin to ano also to inspire and to ano to, to inspire and to respect diba the yung sacrifices ng ano natin no? we treat, treat, treat the uniform with respect when doing the reenactment so kahit hindi snappy lagi because yung Philippines as, as only semi professional and even unprofessional in certain ways diba uh we still ano you move you act in a way that that ano na that doesn't really disrespect yung ano yung history oh. Thank you, Diego. Um, there is another question dito sa Q&A. Accurate po ba uniforms ng Guardia Civil sa Maria Clara at Ibarra po? <laughs> like sa Alperes? Mm. Oh, um, I, I actually recently watched some of the episodes. I, I, I haven't finished it. I've just started it actually. Pero actually, medyo nag ano eh. There was yung isang, yung isang, yung, naalala ko yung isang scene ng Alperes na ano, uh, the first, yung isang scene na, uh, ayun, officer siya sa Spanish Army or sa Guardia Civil. I'm not sure. Pero he was wearing an 1860-style uniform na, in, pero it's set in the 1880. And, tama ba? 1870s, 80s yung no limitang hire. Uh, around that time, pero he was wearing an 1860-style uniform. So, okay, not it's not all correct. Na, na, well, for the, ano, I think, I I, I do think that Maria Claret Ibarra does a bet does a better job than most, but I think it's not fully enough. I, I actually actually you know I would like to defer this question then to Mr. Alex Avila because he did a lot of the research on our Guardia Civil uniform. So could you address that question in, Sir and Sir Alex? Yeah, okay. <laughs> when I when I read that question, I, okay, that would be mine. But yeah. There's a comment on regarding the Alperes uniform in Maria Clara at Ibarra. Actually, yes, it's inaccurate. It's not the accurate uh, Alperes uniform because it much more look like, yeah, sabi mo, Sir Diego, it looks like the tercio. So the tercio uniform kasi and yung tricone, yung may, may pagka-tricone yung style ng hat, that's already mostly present in Peninsula, Spanish, Spain. So it wasn't existing here in the Philippines, but I, I don't know. I cannot blame then yung Maria Clara Ibarra on that. And <laughs> kasi I mean, w- w- a lot of ano may artistic liberty rin naman. And actually, it's not just only that uniform, but also their Guardia Civil is inaccurate then. But it's another thing. It's an it's for another time to talk about. Yun lang ang masasabi ko. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Sir Alex. So, ano, last question na siguro, it's almost so, Oh, yeah, 4.30. Ayun. Um, nasabi ni Diego kanina na, although this is a hobby, may, may, may part din siya na for education eh. So, syempre, history, yung historical education, lagi tayo nakakwestiyon dyan on relevance eh. Kaya tayo napagmumove on lagi. So, uh, how do we keep this relevant to us today? Siguro, yun yung last question na lang. Ayun. In terms so, of education. Actually, in yung historical reenactment, no, I think it's a it's a very good exercise in uh two things, no. I think one is empathy, no, and the other is uh yun nga, trying one is actually connecting the past to the present, diba? Keeping it relevant. Kasi may kita mo dun sa whether we do battle reenactments, no, or 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 reenactments of specific other specific events uh or whether we're just i know marching around doing drills showing showing the drills of that they did during that time um people the people who are watching and filipinos especially who are watching they get to connect with the past diba? they get to re- they get to f- see see the past in a way that's kind of more relatable so actually i want to go outside then mid the military sphere ng historical reenactment because uh the the field of living history the, the activities of living history marami no uh more than beyond the military it it goes into the cultural diba uh cultural everyday life diba things like you know food diba there there are people like that that 
that research how to prepare food uh, as they uh, in a historical way like diba mga lumang lakas ng ulan mga lumang ano mga lumang cookbooks ganun and the the methods of cooking or even like yung mga folk dances traditional folk dances and when they are performed in Filipiniana in a way that is a kind of living history as well no so uh and in in fashion even in that wearing yung mga fashion ng ng panahon all of that it's ano it, it's a form of uh it's 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 a form it's a form of education it's not only in that it's not only for fun but diba also for connecting people with their past it's showing na showing na okay ah diba it, it helps people you know okay i said practice design empathy because it's it it helps you understand uh events diba events of the past through the eyes of ordinary people no na ganito ganito pala sila no and you see them you see them less as you see it helps you see people of the past less as just figures na malayo na and as people as people like you and me uh and that, that's one of the that's one of the things and you know, it's educational not only for the audiences and but also for reenactors and living history uh workers and uh and hobbyists because people who are wearing those uniforms they run they march they they shoot well, we don't shoot real guns but you know if, in other countries diba like the US diba they they actually shoot guns diba uh not 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 with live rounds of course pero they get to experience that and they get to feel na, they get to connect with people diba connect with people who have been gone for 100 200 years no and we realize na ayun we really we get I think yeah, person. I know, this is a personal thing. Na, I I I had this realization doing drills and and all of these things, doing battle reenactments. Na you get you you, know, you get you get you get to feel closer to these people who are who have lived fifty, a hundred, about even two hundred years before you were even born. No, and it puts into it 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 really you know it 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 puts it stresses talaga na. The past is not the past is not something na talagang black and white and ano it, it bring it, it it brings history it gives you a new perspective talaga sa ano sa history so so yan yan ang ano ko yan. more more on personal ano ko yan on ano how how we keep it re- how it's relevant yeah. and how related to ano, keeping history relevant no okay thank you um gusto ko si nabe mo na it- it connects us to our past and yun naman talaga essence so thank you very much Diego and um, Sir Alex so to wrap up this um, webinar okay I'd like to promote our social media pages the Intramuros administration is on Facebook Twitter Instagram and YouTube And um, if you miss any of our previous episodes or if you came in late today, you can still view them on our YouTube channel. And please don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And I would also like to enjoin everyone to help Intramuros claim a back-to-back win for Asia's leading tourist attraction. To, to vote, please go to www.worldtravelawards.com slash vote or scan the QR code here. And register to create that account and then um, wait for the confirmation email, verify your account. And to cast a vote, select Asia from the region menu and choose Asia's leading tourist attraction, number 119, and vote for Intramuros Philippines. The deadline of voting is on July 23. So yeah, please help us um, claim a back-to-back win. And Clean Intramuros, our co- Community-driven cleanup drive is also continuous. Tuloy-tuloy po ito. So for those who are interested to volunteer, please stay tuned uh, to IA's Facebook page and other online channels for the registration link and schedules kung kailan po ginaganap ito. And um, for latest updates and announcements about Intramuros, including uh, yung mga reenactments and activities by RFRG in Intramuros, Join our Viber community by scanning the QR code here or going to bit.ly slash IA Viber. This is also posted on our media accounts. So that's all for now. At maraming maraming salamat po at magkita-kita po ulit tayo sa susunod. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, IA.